Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for this Part B Interventional Pain Management Common Rejections and Denials webinar. This webinar is designed for those who submit claims on the CMS 1500 claim form or the 837P electronic claim. My name is Mary Muko. I'm a specialist on the Provider Outreach and Education team at WPS GHA. I will be your speaker today. Assisting me is my friend and colleague, Ellen Barra. We include this disclaimer in all our education to remind learners that although we made every effort to provide current information that is correct, the information is subject to change. It is on the CMS website where you will find the Medicare rules that determine final coverage. These laws, regulations, and rulings will always prevail. These are what determines final coverage. We will provide responses to questions based on the facts given. And just one last reminder, CMS prohibits recording of this presentation for profit making purposes. We are recording this event today and we will be making it available later on our YouTube channel and for 90 days following this event on the Encore Presentations webpage on our website. You may have noticed in our advertisement that our agenda shows that this presentation really focuses on data. In their internet-only manual, it's publication 100-09, chapter 6, CMS instructs the MAX to analyze and provide education based on claim submission errors. Claim submission errors include those that result in rejected or denied claims. Max shall maintain a provider data analysis program that produces a monthly list of the most frequently claim submission errors, or the most frequently rejected and denied claim submission errors, I should say, uh, for providers in their entire jurisdiction. So this program today really includes um, those most common rejections and denials, um, inadvertent clerical or administrative, or other errors that could be prevented through outreach and education. So for today's webinar, then, I advertise that I would discuss data for Specialty 09 providers. Topics I said I would cover include those common rejections and denials, and the ways to fix or avoid those rejections and denials. I'm also going to provide some helpful resources, and these are what's going to help you fix and avoid those rejections and denials that I'm going to reveal and talk about today. Finally, I advertised that I would answer questions about these common rejections and denials, those that I'm discussing today. So to fully understand rejections and denials, it is important to recognize the path that a claim takes or what we sometimes call or refer to as the life of a claim. This is really a simplified graphic on how a claim gets into our system. The service is provided, a claim is submitted, and sometimes the system rejects those claims. And when that occurs, a 277 or a 999 report is generated to explain why. This slide describes claim submission. Most providers submit claims electronically. There are actually very few providers who qualify for a waiver under a law that prohibits payment of any Medicare service or supply when the provider didn't bill that claim electronically to Medicare. Now, to confirm claim receipt, providers should use the 999 report, and providers would use the 277 report for more specific information about that claim submission. Our Electronic Data Interchange, or EDI staff, provides helpful information in some companion guides that they make available on the EDI website. You can see that I've hyperlinked the uh, guide here on this particular slide. 
So this is going to help then clarify and further define the data content requirements for electronic claims. And based on these reports, you will know if the batch is rejected and if you need to correct or resubmit. This then is a simplified graphic that shows what happens to a claim when Medicare deems it as what Med CMS refers to as unprocessable. Unprocessable is another name for rejection. This is a slide that provides a slide by or side by side comparison of a rejected claim to a denied claim. And these really are very, very different. And it's important to understand the difference so that you know uh, the actions that you can consider taking to fix or resubmit the particular claim or have the claim paid later on at an appeal. Uh, I think that even people within our office or within Medicare sometimes uh, uses these terms interchangeably and you can see by comparing the left side here to the right side that really very very different things happen when a claim is rejected versus when it's denied. If a claim is rejected it is as I mentioned deemed as unprocessable and this means that the claim is returned on the front end. It's never adjudicated. Uh, services or supplies can be rejected because there is invalid or missing or incorrect information or something that just simply doesn't make sense. For these claims, rejected claims or unprocessable claims, there are no appeal rights. What you need to do is resubmit the service or fix it, resubmit it. When you receive the remittance advice for a rejection, there will be an MA-130 and CO16 code on that remittance advice. We're going to talk about those codes in just a little bit in a little more detail. For rejected claims, the patient is never liable for payment. Denied claims, on the other hand, are adjudicated. Uh, Medicare does not make claim because uh, it doesn't make, meet Medicare's payment criteria. Could be due to a law or what we call a statutory requirement. Perhaps the claim doesn't meet Medicare's medical necessity requirements, and this would include any utilization guidelines or frequency parameters. Uh, other claims will deny due to eligibility. It could be eligibility of, of the provider or the person that's rendering the service uh, or to the, uh, the beneficiary. When a claim is denied on that remittance advice, you will see an MA01 and that particular code uh, on the remittance advice provides appeal rights for a particular claim. Now, most claims have appeal rights when they are claims that are denied. Um, there are some exceptions, however, so you'll want to look for that MA01 code on the remittance advice in order to determine if there are appeal rights. For denied claims, of course, patient liability is determined. Now this graphic shows then the path for a processed claim. Again, the service is provided, a claim is submitted to Medicare, most often electronic as I mentioned, and the claim line or lines will either pay or deny. And then the remittance advice is generated. The remittance advice is uh, very, very important. Uh, sometimes we refer to it as the remittance notice. Other times we'll shorten it up a bit and simply call it an RA. Now most providers will receive an electronic remittance advice or ERA as opposed or as opposed to the standard paper remittance or the SPR. Now, depending on the, how that claim is processed, it may include information about any adjustments that are made to the claim or to denials. It could also include information about something that could be missing or is missing. And sometimes it actually provides notice about refunds and offsets. The ERA also provides payment information about that transfer of funds and payment processing from a health plan to a health care provider's bank. Now, codes on the remittance advice 
do provide information about the claim. Claim Adjustment Reason Codes, C-A-R-C-S, uh, we call them CARCs sometimes, explain why a claim paid differently than it was billed or submitted. A Remittance Advice Remark Code, or R-A-R-C, uh, sometimes we call these RARCs, uh, provide more details about an adjustment that is described by the Claim Adjustment Reason Code. Another type of code that appears on the remittance advice is a group code, and these convey the financial responsibility for any unpaid portion of the claim balance. A CO stands for contractual obligation, and this means the provider is liable. The provider cannot bill the patient. A PR means that the patient is financially responsible. You can find code lists on the Washington Publishing Company's website. This is a contractor for CMS that maintains those codes for CMS. We understand that some of the codes may be a bit cryptic or may seem out of date. Uh, for example, some of the code messages may include an outdated acronym. And we do receive comments from providers sometimes about these codes and the fact that they're cryptic or the, the messages are cryptic or the, some of the message uh, includes an outdated uh, acronym, for example. But WPS GHA is unable to change these because it is the Washington Publishing Company that maintains these codes. Uh, if you go to the website uh, that I have included the link to on this particular slide, you'll be able to contact the Washington Publishing Company if you wish to do so and make comments about any of their codes or their reason codes uh, if you care to do that. Here are just a couple of uh, some great resources if you're seeking more information about the remittance advice. These are actually some uh, good resources that I found available out on the CMS's website. So more resources for you. Next, I do want to talk about whether you need to correct or appeal the max decision to pay or deny a claim. So for those of you that may be unfamiliar with that acronym that I just used, MAC, M-A-C, uh, it stands for Medicare Administrative Contractor, and WPS GHA is the Jurisdiction 5 and Jurisdiction 8 Medicare Administrative Contractor. Now after reviewing the RA, what you'll need to do is choose what action you will take. For an unprocessable or rejected claim, you're going to need to fix the error and resubmit the claim to Medicare. If the claim or the claim line denied, there may be multiple actions to choose from. Uh, there are times that for a denied service, you can simply resubmit the service. You might also be able to use a process called the clerical error reopening to fix clerical errors. And CMS defines clerical errors, including minor errors or omissions, as human or mechanical errors. And these can be on the part of the provider or the contractor. And I'll talk more about that clerical error reopening process a little bit later in this webinar. Another action to consider is an appeal. Uh, the remittance advice will provide appeal rights, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll discuss appeals also just a little bit later in this webinar. Now, if you are a registered user of the WPS GHA transactional portal, that's the secure portion of our website, you will be able to render a clerical error reopening yourself or request an appeal if you are logged into that transactional portal. Now, this is a self-service tool that really does offer a lot of efficiencies for many of uh, a number of functionalities. Our portal user manual provides illustrations and also step-by-step -step instructions on how to use these portal features. I want to talk now about that clerical error reopening process. It is a process to correct human or mechanical errors. Clerical errors or minor errors are limited to errors in form and content. 
but they don't include failure to bill for certain items or services. The final bullet here on this slide links to a helpful resource on our website, and it does provide examples of situations that can and cannot be processed as a clerical error reopen, reopening. Um, it also explains how you can request a clerical error reopening via telephone or fax. And remember that you can use our transactional portal for self-service. That portal user, user manual that I talked about uh, does provide instructions. You can uh, submit these or submit a clerical error reopening request or render one uh, within one year of your remittance advice receipt date. Just to throw a few examples of clerical error submissions or acceptable clerical error, sub, uh, clerical error submissions um, your way, um, I can give you some examples. It would be mathematical, computational mistakes, perhaps a transposed procedure or diagnostic code, inaccurate data entry, uh, maybe misapplication of a fee, fee schedule, or even a computer error. Here's a little bit of information for you about uh, appeals. There are five levels of appeals. Now for most claim denials, as I mentioned, you can request an appeal and the remittance advice will inform you of those uh, those rights. The purpose of the appeals process is really to ensure the correct adjudication of claims. Physicians, suppliers, and beneficiaries all have the right to appeal a claim determination that's made by the MAC. The MAC renders only level one redeterminations. And remember I mentioned earlier, WPSGAJ is the MAC for region or jurisdiction five and jurisdiction eight. Um, so redeterminations, that first level of appeal, are rendered at WPSGHA. The beneficiary or his or her representative may request an appeal on any service that's processed for them. Providers and suppliers, though, may appeal services for which they accepted assignment. But for unassigned claims, providers and suppliers can act as the beneficiary's representative, but only if the beneficiary signs an authorization statement. And an example of that would be the CMS 1696 Appointment of Representative form. We have links to CMS forms on our website. CMS has them on their website as well. In addition, providers and suppliers can request a redetermination, that level one uh, appeal uh, on an assigned claim if Medicare denied the service as not reasonable and necessary, or if the provider or supplier billed in excess of the limiting charge. And in that case, the provider or supplier would need to refund any fees collected from the beneficiary. As I mentioned, there are five levels of appeal. The first level is that redetermination, the only level done here at WPS. There are time limits that apply when submitting an appeal, time limits for all five levels of appeal. There's also time limits that apply uh, to completion of the appeal. Additionally, there is a minimum amount in controversy, sometimes called the AIC. It's a threshold that applies only for level three and level five appeals. Uh, these amounts can change from year to year. You can combine like details on more than one claim in order to reach that threshold, in order to reach that amount in controversy. Here are a couple of my favorite resources uh, for appeals. Um, one is the resource that is available on our website. It's called How to Appeal a Claim Determination. But I think my personal favorite is one that CMS publishes. I like to share this when I'm talking about appeals uh, to providers and suppliers. And it's actually a process flowchart. CMS updates it annually. So if you're looking at it towards the end of the year or early in the new year, you're going to want to pay particular attention to the date on the bottom of that flowchart. Uh, this is the link, of course, to the 2024 information, but sometimes information on the flowchart will change. Uh, mostly what I'm talking about here is that amount in controversy for levels three and five appeals. 
So just be cognizant of that. I like the flow chart because you can easily look at it and see time frames that apply to request the appeal. And then, of course, the time frames that apply uh, for completion of that appeal request. So some really, really great information. All right, I provided a lot of information for you about rejections and denials, and you need, do need to understand the difference in order to um, recognize these rejections and denials that I'm going to talk about now based on information that I've pulled from uh, what we call the claim rejections dashboard or the data dashboard. So for today's presentation, when I was looking for those reasons why Specialty 09 claims are rejecting and denying in our jurisdictions, I looked at the data that includes all six of our states, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Indiana, and Michigan. Uh, for today's webinar, I looked only at claims that were submitted by specialty 09 providers. Uh, 09 is the two digit specialty code assigned by CMS for interventional pain management providers. The submission dates on the dashboard and available when I pulled the data for this webinar today are February 1 of this year through April 30 of 2024. And the data in that dashboard was last refreshed on May 7 of 2024. And what that means is that if you submitted, if you were a specialty 09 provider, you submitted a claim to WPS um, after May 7 for the, those submission dates here on this slide, uh, the data for that would not be included uh, in this presentation. For those of you unfamiliar uh, with Specialty 09, I'm going to pop back here a slide. Uh, CMS assigns two-digit specialty codes for providers when they are enrolling in Medicare. Providers self-designate their specialty. And when we process claims at WPS, we use only the primary specialty as self-designated by the provider when he or she enrolled. Uh, now we do recognize that some providers do have more than one specialty and we keep that information in the eligibility files for the provider or the supplier. However, we process claims only based on that primary specialty. Now there are some situations where a service may deny, a provider would need to request an appeal and then inform Medicare and let us know that their eligibility file should show this additional specialty code and that you're requesting payment based on that additional specialty or that secondary specialty or that third specialty that's on file. But when we process claims, computer logic will only use that primary specialty code. All right, let's now look at that data. As advertised, I mentioned that I would reveal those common rejections and denials for Specialty 09 providers. And I'm first going to talk about rejections. And remember, rejections and denials are very, very different. Rejections are those that have invalid, incomplete, or missing information. Uh, those that you need to fix and resubmit. So, in looking at the data that I pulled from that dashboard for 09 specialty providers, um, I have listed for you the common rejections by the reason code. And remember, I mentioned to you that sometimes that reason code that prints out on the remittance advice is a little bit uh, cryptic. Uh, sometimes it includes outdated information such as this first one. I say cryptic because it doesn't always make sense. These are common rejections. However, look at that first word in the first bullet. It says denied, but it's really a rejected claim. You need to fix it and resubmit it. Your remittance advice will say denied field 11 of HICFA 1500 must be completed. 
Well, there is another great example of something that I talked about earlier in that the reason codes may include outdated information. It's no longer referred to as the HICFA 1500. It is the CMS 1500 claim form. So for this particular rejection, there was 502 rejections or unprocessable claims for 09 specialty providers for the submission dates I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, 502 rejections. Uh, field 11 of the 1500 must be completed. If you look in the CMS claim form instructions or in the electronic crosswalk claim, uh, claim form instructions, uh, you will see that field 11 can't be left blank. And that's typically what happens and why claims deny. Field 11 is left blank, but if there is no other insurance that could be primary to Medicare, what you will need to do here is it include the word none in field 11 or the electronic equivalent. Next rejection, the authorization number is missing, invalid, or incomplete. Uh, we have some processes within Medicare that require providers to place an authorization number on the claim form. Um, so for example, those uh, claims that require a pre-authorization will need an authorization number on the claim form. I'll provide for you some uh, resources uh, that you can use to make certain that you are correctly applying that authorization number to your claims um, a bit later on in this presentation. The third bullet, claim lacks information needed for adjudication, 341 rejections. Um, this one is one where you're going to have to review the claim and make certain that you're including all of the information that is required or situational. Uh, we have a tool, and I'm going to show, you to you, show it to you in a little bit, that tells you when something's required or situational. Uh, another thing you can do in this case is look at some of the other um, reason codes that print out on the remittance advice uh, to see what it is that that particular claim was lacking. Uh, next rejection, states denied also, even though it's a rejected claim or unprocessable claim. 102 rejections uh, during this time period because the rendering physician number was invalid or it was missing. You need to submit a new claim for that service. Um, check to make sure that you included this information on the claim. If you did include it, check to see that it was keyed correctly. Uh, this is very similar to the next common rejection, 73 of them, missing, incomplete, invalid, ordering primary identifier. Many services uh, that Medicare uh, can consider payment for requiring ordering pro, uh, provider. You need, need to make certain that that's included on the claim in the proper place. You need to make certain that it is complete um, and that it's not keyed in correctly, making it invalid. Next up is missing incomplete invalid name strength or dosage. Um, when billing for not otherwise classified codes or for uh, some uh, drugs and biologicals. The claim requires that you include the name, the strength, and the dosage in item 19 or the electronic equivalent. And this is a commonly reject, uh, common rejection reason uh, for claims that are submitted by 09 providers, 57 of them to be exact. Claim submitted or a claim must be submitted to the RRB is the next one. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with RRB, that stands for Railroad Retirement Board. Uh, there is one MAC that is responsible for processing claims for those railroad retirees. One way to avoid this particular rejection is to ask providers to see their Medicare cards when they present for services. If a beneficiary is a railroad retirement beneficiary and claims are to be processed by the Railroad Retirement Board, there will be identification at the bottom of that beneficiary's Medicare card that shows that this is a railroad retirement provider and that you'll need to, or beneficiary rather, and that you'll need to submit that claim to the Railroad Retirement Board. Uh, later in this section that I'm going to talk about that provides um, resources, I will point out to you how you can find information on the RRB. Clinic number missing or not entered correctly, 29 claims. Uh, that one you'll need to check to see, was the clinic number submitted? Was it entered correctly or not? Missing procedure modifier. 
26 rejections. Uh, some, mod uh, some procedures would require modifiers based on policy or Medicare rules and guidelines. Um, if that modifier is missing, uh, you'll need to determine which modifier is appropriate, uh, append it to the service, and then of course resubmit the claim. Or of course you may be able to uh, use the self-service technology to render that uh, clerical error reopening uh, by yourself using that self-service tool. Uh, we have resources I'll point out to you later where you can find those modifiers. The next one is um, IDE missing from our claim. We do have a resource on our website. Uh, it links to a CMS web page that provides you with information on the IDE process claim form instructions and so on. Uh, claim form instructions in the crosswalk that I'm going to show you in a little bit actually provides information on where you need to include an IDE number investigational device exception uh, on your claim form. It is in item 23 of the uh, paper claim form or the electronic equivalent. Now I advertise that I would uh, reveal those top rejections. I thought it would be um, just kind of a bonus uh, to include those HCPCS or CPT codes that are commonly rejected. And remember, I just told you the most common reasons why these particular codes and other codes, of course, I just used the top 10 or top 12 here on this particular claim, uh, the most commonly rejected HCPCS or CPT codes submitted by the 09 specialties in our jurisdiction. Um, you can see a couple of ENM codes there, the 213 and 214, 99213 and 99214, that is. Uh, some of these codes, uh, for example, 64493 is the facet joint intervention for pain management. Um, similarly, the 94, the 64635, 64636. Um, all of those numbers there, by the way, represent the number of rejections for the data that I pulled. Um, these are those facet joint inter, um, inter, uh, intervention for pain management procedures. Um, I've asked Ellen to place some uh, resources for you into the chat. Uh, four facet joint inter interventions. Actually, this one is um, that I've asked her to place here is a documentation checklist that will help you make certain your documentation includes all of the information in it that you will need in order to receive payment for this service or the information that you need to place on the claim form uh, to avoid these rejections. Uh, you can see some other codes there. Um, one is arthrocentesis and then, of course, nerve blocks. And I'm going to provide a little bit more information about those particular codes um, that is some of the policy links a bit later on in this presentation. But first I do want to talk about common, re uh, common denials. I almost made the mistake of saying rejections when it really truly is denials that I'm talking about here. Um, for as long as I've been in outreach, and for many of the years I've been in Medicare, and it's been quite, quite some time, uh, duplicate claims continue to be problematic. Um, I am doing a series of common rejections and denials. I'm going um, by each particular two-digit code special or two-digit specialty code and, and revealing those common rejections and denials and then talking about them, how you can fix them, what you need to look for, where you can find more information. Um, and this one, the duplicate charge paid, um, the next uh, question mark 002XX um, is, if, it, if this was on a remit or an RA, there would be a date there. So duplicate charge paid on such and such a date on claim um, and that next information that prints out uh, represents an ICN of a claim. So basically what this is, is this, this, this is a duplicate charge um, that we already paid. And when the remittance advice uh, denial reason prints out, it tells you on what day and on what code. Uh, 466 rejections. That's a lot of claims being submitted needlessly. Um, when you continue to submit duplicate claims, it's considered abusive. Uh, you should not just automatically submit claims to Medicare on a, you know, a billing basis or a 30-day basis. If you are using 
a um, billing service who automatically submits your claims every 30 days, every 60 days, you need to tell them to stop doing that. It is considered abusive. You need to make every effort you can uh, to make certain that the claim um, has not already been paid or that a new claim is being submitted when it should not be. Next one, very, very popular across all um, specialties, not just for your specialty, 09, collection of fee for service during periods of managed care. Now that one's a little bit cryptic. Um, I actually checked with internal staff to make certain that I that it is what I thought it was. This is a denial that's um, being, uh, being made, uh, a denial being done because the beneficiary is a managed care or uh, a Part C beneficiary. And, and of course, that would be an eligibility type denial. Uh, if you look at some of the resources on our website that I'm going to talk about later, we actually categorize different denials. We have duplicate denials. We have eligibility denials. We have bundling denials and so on and so forth. So I'll point that out to you when we get there. Um, the next one, speaking of bundling, Medicare does not pay separately. There are certain services that are bundled, always bundled, uh, on the relative value file that CMS maintains on their website. It's included as a resource in your your handout. Um, if there's a B in the status code column, that means that that service will never be paid separately. Uh, there are other situations where a modifier may be appended to a procedure in order to unbundle payment, and that's part of the National Correct Coding Initiative. I'll point that out later on also. Uh, another uh, type bundling here, payment included in another service received on the same day, that typically would be your uh, procedure to procedure code edits that you would need to look at. Those are part of the National Correct Coding Initiative. When you have two codes billed by the same provider during the same encounter or the same patient on the same day, typically the column two uh, procedure is going to bundle or payment for that service is going to bundle in the payment one or the column one code. Um, there are times when, um, if you look at the edit tables, uh, a modifier may be used, and there's indicators on those tables um, that tell you when or you, when you you may consider a pending modifier. They don't say append a modifier; it says you may append a modifier. And what that means is that you need to look at documentation to make certain that the uh, the use of a modifier is justified. Of course, there might be some situations where another claim is in the system or has already been processed that might. Um, make that bundling, uh, the combination of those two codes uh, happen. Uh, Medicare will not pay for this service for this condition, 224. That is going to be a denial that's driven uh, by policy uh, or Medicare rules and guidelines that are published, um, typically a medical, medical necessity. Medicare is not going to pay for this service for this condition. Uh, what you would need to consider here is looking at that local coverage determination for that particular procedure or service uh, to see if it meets WPS's uh, conditions for payment, and if so, you may need to uh, submit additional documentation and request an appeal if your service was denied. I'll show you in a little bit how you can search our web, our search for uh, local coverage determinations or co coding and billing articles to see if ACPT code is covered in one of those. Here are more denials by reason. There's that duplicate charge again. And if you think about a claim and how much it costs to prepare and submit it, how much it costs us to, to you know, make certain it's valid and can come in the door and be processed, um, these duplicate charges cost everyone money, so we really do want to do everything we can to eliminate those. It's it's costly for both the provider and for the beneficiary. 207 claims they're denied for that particular duplicate denial. Medicare does not pay for this many services in this time period. Um, this would be a utilization parameter. Um, typically, you're going to find this information published within a policy. It could be a local coverage determination. It could be a national coverage determination. And again, I'll show you how to search by CPT or HCPCS code to see if we have a policy or there's a national uh, coverage determination uh, for a particular item or procedure. Referring provider not eligible to refer this service. This is a situation uh, where maybe uh, the code was uh, keyed in correctly, but what, whatever that referring provider, that, that code for that referring provider is not, um, it shows that that 
referring provider is not eligible. Um, so that provider would need to check eligibility files, make sure everything's up to date and such. Or, you know, that could be a situation where you keyed one referring provider's number that's not eligible uh, as opposed to another eligible referring provider. Procedure build is not correct or valid for services or dates of service build. Here you're going to want to check the relative value file, that file that CMS publishes. You'll want to check that status code. I talked about status B, bundled codes earlier. Um, here we're talking about codes that are active. You're going to be looking for A, um, that the active uh, code, status code on that relative value file. And finally, the last of those that I'm um, talking about today during this common rejections and denials webinar is that the claim denied 125 of them uh, because uh, the or claim lines the uh, claim must be sent to the employer group health plan or a large group health plan first this folks is one of those situations when there is another insurer that um, is primary to Medicare uh, those Medicare secondary payer situations. Uh, we've got some great resources out on our website. Um, that's what you'll want to refer to in order to avoid these denials. Here then are those common denials by HCPCS and CPT codes. Um, the J3490 I want to point out is an un unclassified drug. Uh, remember you're going to need to include name, dosage, strength, and and that information on your claim form so that we know what it is you're billing for and that information would be in item 19. A um, couple other codes to talk about, nerve block codes I see there the 64483. Um, I have asked Ellen to place some links uh, into the chat that um, are those policies or billing and coding articles connected to policies for some of those services that are showing up here on this list of commonly denied HCPCS and CPT codes. We have, once again, those facet joint interventions for pain management. Uh, we also have the epidural steroid injections for pain management uh, policy that speaks to some of the items that are here or the codes that are on this list and so on and so forth. So just some additional information available for you. Nerve blocks for peripheral neuropathy is also one of those policies that would help you uh, recognize why these services are denying. And again, I will show you how to find that in just a moment when I talk about the uh, resources. We can look at other dashboards or our claims dashboard to do a further breakdown of data. We can drill down to counties and states. Uh, by by the code, by the reason. We can also take a look at trending. Uh, one particular uh, thing that I like to do is if I am asked by a professional organization um, to do a presentation for them or to be a speaker at a conference, I like to drill down the data and talk about the counties that surround the place that I am speaking at um, so that it's very, very relevant. Not just, you know, specialty, but by county. Here's an example of what, we, what we're talking about with trending trending or data trending. Um, the code description in this case was a denial. It was the time limit for filing your claim has expired, no appeal. This is one of those exceptions, folks, when you cannot request an appeal on a denied claim. If the time limit for filing your claim has expired, you have no appeal rights. This particular dashboard that we have shows that there was 66 claims denied for this reason uh, during the current three months. The three months prior to that, only 22 denials happened. The difference is 44. The percentage of change is 200%. And then there's kind of a visual that prints out on this uh, database. Um, it's the difference in uh, claim change. Um, and it will show, uh, for example, an increase by, by giving us a visual and just showing us an arrow going up. And of course, we want to look at this trending to help us recognize what we need to ed create education on. And we're looking for those, um, those arrows to be showing down, downward trend. We want those rejections and denials to be decreasing. Here then are resources. I know a lot of these are those that I kind of hit upon when I was talking about the particular rejection and denial reasons and why or how you uh, fix it or avoid it. 
Here are those, um, those claim form instructions uh, in Chapter 26. Um, that is for the CMS 1500 claim form, completing and processing it, of course. I mentioned to you the crosswalk, and what I'm talking about here um, is a crosswalk, and I'm going to pull this over and show you. On the home page of our website, over here on the right middle page, you'll see quick links. One of them is EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. I'm going to select that and scroll down. This takes you out to our EDI website. And I'm going to choose Medicare EDI for WPS Mac J8 and J5. And when you're on the home page then of the Medicare EDI website, you're going to find uh, links to those companion guides I talked about very early on in my presentation. Uh, the 999 report, the 277 report, that actually explains the data content for claims and what's needed and not. But what I want to talk about now is this crosswalk and I am going to open it. This is a crosswalk that takes you uh, from the paper claim form, I'm going to get this down here and kind of make it a little bit bigger here, close that. Um, this shows you for an item number on the paper claim form, so this is for example here, 24A of the paper claim form, that's where the data service goes. This shows you, I'm going to scroll back to the top. Um, the version 5010 loop, the data element description, and its status uh, for that particular entry on the electronic claim form. Also provides requirements for the version 5010 claim form over here on the right. So basically what this does, folks, is it takes you from the paper claim form and crosswalks it to where it goes on electric claim form. Uh, claim form. This status column on this particular crosswalk uh, is explained at the bottom of every page. If there's an R in the, uh, the status column, it means it's required. The data element is needed to process a claim. Remember what I talked about earlier today, something's missing, um, your claim is being rejected. If you don't put a required uh, data element on your claim, it could reject. It could be one of those reasons. Um, there are times when a data element must be completed, but only if other conditions exist. And that is what we call situational. And then in that case, you'll see an S over here in this column. Uh, one of the, uh, the things I talked about today was the IDE information was missing. Um, in order to find where that goes, I came, I can do a search, I did a control F and I'm looking for information on the crosswork that pertains to IDEs. Uh, and I'm finding lots of it here, of course, identifier. Um, I'm just going to use the word device for investigational de device exemption number. That was one of our reasons for rejections and denials that we talked about earlier. The ID need, the IDE number is needed on the claim form uh, in item 23. That's how I knew it was 23 when I was talking to you earlier today. Um, this is the version 5010. Here is the loop. This is the data element description, and here it's just situational. That means it doesn't have to go on every claim, but it does need to go on the claim. In this case, these are the requirements, what it is you need to submit on the claim. And those resources that I told you about earlier that I'm going to point out to you talk about the IDE, that investigational device exemption process, and when you need to enter it on the claim. So a lot of times there's multiple tools that you can use uh, to resubmit your claim um, or correct your claim. For rejections, we have a resource on our website and there are many remark codes. Remember those reason and remark codes, those CARCs and RARCs that I talked about earlier today. These explain, these reasons explain why something rejected. Uh, we have a number of those codes listed in this particular resource on our website, and it tells you what you need to do to correct that rejected claim or unprocessable claim. Similarly, here's that claim denial or common claim denial resource I talked about um, that lists by category, bundling, global surgery, entitlement, provider number denials, duplicate. Um, this lists for these categories, reason and remark codes, and will show you how to, uh, what you need to do in order to either fix it or request your appeal. Some of them you can do on your own. Um, I want to 
Oops. I'm going to the WPS website, or not CMS. Going to back to the WPS website, um, you can see here I've included timely filing of claims listed here, and I've linked to this article, but I want to show you how to find it. Uh, I just, I'm a searcher, not a navigator, folks, so a lot of times you'll see me searching. Um, but I put timely, um, well, and it went away on me, timely filing. Um, if you didn't have the link and you're out working and you don't want to come to this PowerPoint, right here, just go up and search timely filing, and you'll find this great resource that we have on our website that speaks to denials for timely filing. Okay. What I want to point out here, folks, is this particular language that's italicized. This italicized language is from the CMS Publication 100-04. That's the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, specifically Chapter 34, and you can link to it here from our website, that talks about those claims that are not filed within the time limits and it's due to a third party error. We get a lot of questions on that. So this is the resource you would look to for that. And this then tells you how to file a waiver to extend the timely filing requirement to WPS GHA. So some great information if you're looking for that on timely filing. Other resources here, our website, uh, one of the reasons that we talked about today was uh, billing an, uh, an NOC code, um, that particular J3490 bill, uh, NOC code for drug um, hit our lists today that we talked about. Here is a resource that tells you what you need to put on the claim for that. Uh, we talked about uh, denials for employer group health plan, large group health plan. That's Medicare secondary, secondary payer. Uh, you can look at these questions and answers. Some great, great resources for you. We have our YouTube channel. Um, it includes global surgery, prior authorization videos. We've done a number of webinars already that talked about that prime uh, prior authorization process, what it is you need to place on your claim, which codes are those that have this process. Um, so I would encourage you to look to the YouTube channel for that. Uh, the LCD and article lookup uh, is uh, a tool that I told you I would show you. So we're going to do that quickly here. Um, if you are on the WPS GHA website and you uh, want to see if, well, I apologize for that clicked away too quickly. Pull it back over here for you. Sharing my screen. On the home page of our website, there is a code lookup tool right here over on the left. You can search an LCD, which is local coverage determination in the companion article, or you can search for NCDs by title, definition, or code. Um, so for example, if you build one of those codes, the, that hit that most common rejections or denials list, and the code was 64493. If you want to know if there's an LCD or an article for that code, um, you can search for it right here. And right here are links then to the policy for that code. This is going to, in the billing and coding document, provide for you those um, covered diagnosis codes and such. Uh, the LCD itself is going to give you the uh, limitations for coverage. Um, so really, really easy way to see if there uh, is information available, a local coverage determination or article, or a national coverage determination for a particular CPT code or HIPPICS code. Very, very helpful and an easy way or an easier way to avoid these rejections or denials. All right, there's that window back up more resources here. Modifiers, that hit our list. Uh, this takes you to our modifiers web page. We have a list of modifier fact sheets available that explain how to, um, when it is or is not appropriate to use a particular modifier. Live events web page, um, that's where we keep our handouts. Uh, webinar presentation materials rather um, for each of our live events and also provides for you a means to see what we're offering for live events in the future to be educated stay educated stay on top of current rules and regulations um, and then of course it will allow you uh, to click on a link to register encore presentations that's those recordings available 90 days following our event. 
Um, here is a resource on our website that talks about the prior authorization process for hospital outpatient department services. Here's that resource for investigational device exemption. I already showed you the crosswalk that shows you uh, where it is you need to put that information on the claim form. Um, this will help you, this last bullet here, this resource, proper billing for various Medicare Advantage HMO claims. Um, this is information for you about those beneficiaries who have chosen or elected uh, a Medicare Advantage plan, a Part C plan versus Parts A and B. Uh, we had some of those uh, claims that were being denied because the patient was in a Medicare HMO. Uh, here is uh, the link. Uh, to that code lookup tool that I just demonstrated to search local coverage determinations and articles and national coverage determinations too. The coverage database, that has that status column on it. Is it a bundled service? Is it an active service? Uh, if you're not familiar with using the Medicare cover, uh, excuse me, the Medicare, I, I mixed up something. I was talking about the relative value file when I should have been talking about national and local coverage determinations. That's the Medicare coverage database. If you're not, it's a national searchable depository of all of those policies. If you're not familiar with using it, this second bullet here is a link to a fantastic Medicare Learning Network educational tool. Beneficiary notice initiative are for those situations when you believe your service may, I um, apologize for that, I hit the scroll. It, um, when you believe your service is likely to deny is not medically necessary, you need to, of course, provide um, uh, notice to your beneficiary in order for you to not be liable for uh, the charges for those services. So this provides for you instructions and forms. It's a link. Here then are those uh, correct coding initiative edits I talked about. Bundling, those procedure to procedure edit, column one codes, column two codes. The column two code bundles in the column one code. These edits will show you when you can uh, consider appending a modifier only when it's justified by your documentation uh, in order to unbundle the service. There's add on code edits also and medically unlikely edits, which are those units of service um, allowances or thresholds. Uh, the maximum number of services you can bill for that code on one day. Remember that not all codes are have a public um, MUE, a medically unlikely edit. More Medicare Advantage resources. Um, I've also got here listed some ordering and referring files uh, that CMS has on their website that lists all providers who are eligible to order or refer Medicare services, and it includes the identifiers for those particular uh, providers. Here then is the relative value file link that I talked about where you're going to look for that status code column, and I'm sorry I mixed it up a little earlier. Um, that status code column on the relative value file will show you a B if that service is bundled, always bundled. It doesn't matter if you submit an appeal. It's bundled. You'll never receive payment for that service when billed with something else on the same day. Uh, and then, of course, um, those active codes. You know, there was one of those uh, denials that was this code is inactive for this data service or this procedure is not valid for this data service. That would be shown uh, by the status code column on the re relative value file and A would show it active. The IVR is a self-service tool. Uh, you can use 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is limited functionality outside of normal business hours, but this is a tool you can use to check eligibility and find your claim status and details about your claim. You can use voice or telephone keypad. And we do have instructions in our IVR operating guide. I know one of my colleagues is uh, right now offering a series of webinars about the IVR system and how to use it and its functionalities. So if you're not, um, if you're looking for that information, consider looking on our live events webpage and attend these in the future. Uh, the portal I talked about our earlier, um, this too, you can use check eligibility, claim status, even claim details. It provides even more information than you'll find on the remittance advice. So uh, register to be a user, use this self-service tool. It too is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week with limited functionality outside of normal business hours. I do want to show you really quickly where you can find the, um, the portal user manual. 
This is the home page of our website. On every single page, you have the opportunity to click right here to open the portal user manual. It's under the button that says log in to that tool. And also on the bottom of our pages, you can also find links to that portal user manual here under educational opportunities. All right, a lot of resources put together into this particular presentation. I do want to remind you before closing today um, that CMS and Neridian are teaming up to host an annual National Provider Enrollment Conference. It is free, although you'll have to pay your own way to get there and to stay there uh, in San Diego, California on August 28th and 29th. There is a um, link built into your uh, webinar materials uh, that provides a description, a schedule, and registration. And Ellen's also placing that link into the chat feature. This next slide was to be a, um, a few minutes that we could take to um, ask for live questions from the audience. And I'm sorry that we're running late, but you will have an opportunity to submit your questions about anything that I've talked about during these past 62 minutes. I'm going over just a little bit here. Finally, thanks for sticking with me. I know I went a little bit over, but um, just I want to throw one thing at you. Our greatest compliment is when you recommend our education to others. Please consider doing so. It really helps us reach all of the providers, um, those that are looking for current and effective education in our MAC jurisdiction. So on behalf of myself and Alan Barra and all of Provider Outreach and Education, I do want to thank you for participating. We do look forward to those important survey comments and we hope to have you join us for future events. You may now disconnect. Thanks everybody.